Hello, everybody. See you, see you the Thursday afternoon. I hope everybody is well. Let's start the seminar now. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anthony Blazovich. Dr. Blazovich is currently a professor at the Edith Cohn University at Perth, Australia. He's on his sabbatical leave now, and we are glad to have him today. Dr. Blazovich's research is focused on understanding adaptations in muscle, tendon, in the nervous system to acute interventions like muscle stretching and muscle fatigue, as well as to chronic interventions like strength training. He is also interested in understanding the interactions between the muscle and tendon functions during physical activities. One of the main, of the main contributions, contributions in his career is to publish numerous data sets that were not consistent with the commonly held opinion of the time. In his leisure time, Dr. Blazovich enjoys playing and watching sports. In his youth, he was competitive in cricket, uh, track and field, basketball and soccer. He had been a keen rugby player until five years ago when he injured his spine in the tackle during a game. We hope, that he, we hope that he gets over the injury now. now. Aside, from sports, Aside from sports, he enjoys, he enjoys the simple things in life, things in life like, lying like lying on the grass, grass looking at the sky, spending time with his wife, and while exploring, exploring new areas, new areas or, countries. or countries. In case you are interested, Dr. Blazovich's current main focus is to keep his anxiety's weight gain at bay. bay. <laughs> Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Blazovich to tell us more about how to use exercise to engineer master tendon. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Most interesting, Most interesting uh, uh, introduction I've ever had, I think, in any presentation. Any presentation. Uh, it's really, uh, it's to really great here. to be here. Um, I've just been, um, I've just been over in Europe, Europe speaking, very, speaking very, very, very slowly to people whose English is a second language. So it's great to be here and just be able to speak rapidly. If you can't understand, you can't understand a word I'm saying, saying please, please just put your hand up and I'll slow down yeah. <laughs> and I'll try and speak a different form of English. Form of English. I might call you Tony's, Tony's English, English, which is usually like this. Like this. But, if I, but if I do speak incredibly slowly, I won't be able to, able to, be able to get through the presentation. This is, this is just, just the muscle, muscle the main muscle aspect of a longer presentation because I know you guys are experts, are experts in muscle and love to listen to it on a daily basis. That's right. That's right. You, guys you guys all know that in the clinic or on the athletics track, we're trying to improve performance. And the way I've come to look at a human, whether it's right or wrong, is to try try and understand what each part, each part of the robot, of the robot the or the human has to do, has to do and, then and then try and figure out how to use exercise, exercise to build that robot. That robot. So, you guys so you guys, of course, know that we have these muscles. The muscles, the muscles are, our are our main motors. motors. So, it so it makes sense to start, to start with that. With that. And, our motors and our motors are incredible. Are incredible. If I took, if I took your calf muscle right now, which weighs probably just under one kilo, and I string it up with a butcher's hook, which I haven't done before, I promise you this, but if I did, and then, and then electrocuted that, that muscle, it could, it could easily, easily lift 500, 500 kilos. In fact, if, in fact, if I hung about eight or 900, 900 kilos off it, it, it could hold that load, that load without yielding. So muscles, so muscles are incredibly, incredibly strong. strong. So it made so sense when I was a lot younger than I am today. But I thought, well, but I thought, well if we can optimize the muscle, the muscle then we should then be able to move a lot better. And of course, muscles are built differently. We have muscles with very short fibers and large angles relative to its tendon or its pronation. We have other, we muscles, have other that muscles that are much, much longer. And some of these, some of these muscles, muscles are so long that we have to have, have several, several fibers in series in order to span the distance. distance. And of course, and of course these, muscles these muscles work in complicated, complicated ways. ways. In particular, in particular the penate muscles, muscles, here we have a vastus lateralis, lateralis and a vastus, and a vastus intermedius. intermedius. So this is, so this right, is here right here in the thigh with ultrasound. You can see the muscle here undergoing a concentric contraction now. And an eccentric e contraction later. You'll notice, of course, notice, they, of course work they work synchronously, synchronously trying to pull or rotate, almost like, like a rowing stroke. One end, one end the, tendon the tendon would be down, would be down here at the, knee. at the knee. You can also, you can see, also that see that the muscle is anchored. I mean, the muscle is really, really quite dumb. dumb. All it knows is that, that it has to try to contract in some way. But because it's anchored differently, it's different aspect here onto the bone. We end up with some parts of the muscle not moving at all, or even moving in the wrong direction during muscle shortening. And this complexity of muscle activity, muscle activity means that, means that different muscles, different muscles of different, different shapes, shapes different, builds, different builds will function, will function incredibly, incredibly different, different, not just, not just because they have a different, have a different size. muscle size. 
And so when, and I, so was when younger, I was younger, I was reading, reading a lot of information about, about how these line fibred muscles that you see in hamstrings and, 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 and muscles like this are very, are very good for producing force over long distances. distances. In, other words, in other words, they do work on the biomechanics and room like that. Force times a distance. Actually, Actually, to get a long, get a long muscle, muscle, you need a lot of these, these sarcomeres from series. series. And if each, and if each one shortens, shortens at the same time, time you, not you not only get a big distance of shortening, but a high, but a high speed, speed of shortening. Of shortening. And, I and I love giving crap to the physiologists who go on about fiber type, type because, of course, we all know that the length of the fibers or fascicles is the most important determinant of the shortening speed of a muscle, far more important than fiber type. And I thought, wow, so if I could build muscles with long longer fibers, then I could, then make, I could muscles make muscles that shorten, shorten much, much more rapidly and people could, and people could move, move faster. faster. Actually, short, Actually, fibers, short can fibers can also be really good. Be really good. In these, in muscles, these like muscles like your calf, calf muscles, muscles the soleus, soleus gastrocnemius, medialis in particular, we have short, we have short fibers, fibers with fewer, fewer sarcomeres in series. In series. Each, one each one, of course, uses ATP when it tries to contract. Therefore, you have to use oxygen to contract. And the fewer sarcomeres you have in series, the cheaper it is for you to move. So the, the, less the less expensive the movement is, the more economical you are. And it's really good, it's really good to have these on our locomotor muscles, muscles, particularly distal in, in our limbs. Actually, short, Actually, short fibers are also, are also very, stiff. very stiff. If you take any, take any material that's short, that's short it is inherently stiff. stiff. If, I if I have the same material, same material but, make but make it longer, it is more, more compliant. This is just basic physics or basic mechanics. So it means that, so when, it means I'm that when I'm landing on the ground with 200, 200 kilos, kilos worth of force, worth of force during, during jogging, actually, actually these muscle these fibers, muscle fibers tend, not tend not to yield, to even if they're, even if they're slightly only slightly activated, activated because, they're because they're inherently stiff. stiff. So I thought, wow, so this, I thought, is, wow this is great. It means that, it means that if I'm trying, if I'm trying to build a muscle that needs stiffness, stiffness rate, of force, rate of force development, these things, these things I could just, I find, just a find a way to shorten its fascicles and therefore I could optimize its function. Instead of really, of really good, we were using things like ultrasound, like ultrasound. Back, in back in the day. We had really, we had bad, really bad ultrasound, ultrasound measurements. measurements. Unfortunately, today, people are still, people are still taking bad ultrasound, ultrasound, ultrasound measurements. measurements. Nowadays, Nowadays, we try to use extended field of view, and we pay a lot of attention to how we get the images, or we use MRI scanning, and, and slowly but surely, this, uh, the DTI types of MRI are getting more useful to us. And we asked, and we asked certain, certain questions. questions. Uh, for example, for example one, of one of the first questions I asked was, if I take, if I take athletes some athletes who are already, who are already doing, doing heavy, weight heavy weight training, weight training already doing sprint, sprint training and jump training, and, jump training, and, I, give and I give some of them more high speed work, and I expect, and I expect long, fibers long fibers should be good, and I give the, and other, I give half the other half heavy work, heavy work more, weight, more training, weight training, and remove, and remove a lot of their speed and, and jump training. training. Will that affect, will that the, affect the architecture of the muscle? And will, that and will that affect how they move? How they move? Now, what, was now, what was interesting here, here is, we is we put all of our resources, of our resources actually, actually into getting, getting everyone, everyone training together for a period, for a period to, try to try and make the group more homogeneous, and then we, and only, then we change only change their training, their training for, for a short training block, five weeks, which at the time everyone thought I was a bit of an idiot, and at the time I probably just didn't know any better, because as we all know, early adaptations are neural, later adaptations are muscular. So no one expected any muscle adaptations here. But what we found in just five weeks was that the fascicles of the group that increased their sprint and jump and removed their weight training actually did get longer fascicles. Or, as I like to say, when I look at them in ultrasound, they look longer. The group that took away a lot of the speed stuff and added more strength training, they didn't change their fascicle length that we could detect, but they did get a bigger penation angle. And the belief is that that allows more of the contractile tissue onto the tendon and it allows more opportunity for that rowing stroke you saw before. And these types of things should increase the peak strength of a muscle. So of course, I was young and I thought I was a bit of a genius because what I had done is produ uh, produced evidence for the first time that very rapid architectural changes could occur and that they occurred exactly in the direction you'd expect based on the outcome that you're after. But of course, I was troubled with one thing, and that is you don't really want to take weight training away from a lot of your speed athletes. <laughs> so can we use strength training, but still get longer fascicles? And of course, we know about eccentric muscle contractions, and one of the most commonly cited things right now is that eccentric training lengthens your fascicles and adds sarcomeres in series. 
And some of that comes from data like these from Lynn and Morgan in Melbourne many years ago. They'd seen a paper in 1960 where rats who ran downhill got sore muscles and rats that ran uphill didn't get sore muscles. Of course, we all know that eccentric contraction causes soreness, so they made a leap of faith and said, okay, I think that means if you run downhill, you're doing eccentric <coughs> contractions. Why is it that after just a few sessions, we don't get sore anymore? Their hypothesis, we probably add sarcomeres in series, that kind of spreads the load, we no longer get sore. So we thought this was brilliant. We got a whole bunch of people to train on an isokinetic dynamometer. One group did 10 weeks of only knee extension or concentric training. The other group did 10 weeks of only the eccentric training. They complained for a few weeks and then they loved it. And we measured the vastus lateralis fascicle length at the end. And actually both groups got longer fascicles. And then while there was no statistical difference here, if anything, if anything, there was a bias towards the concentric group improving more. So it's not even like a, a quirk of statistics that oh, it just didn't quite reach significance. Actually, we found no evidence that eccentric training caused a priority response of lengthening the fascicles. I started to realize that I wasn't so much of a genius anymore because I didn't get the right answer or the right answer I expected. There are some other data, and a lot of people cite the, the Mar Martino Franchi stuff with Marco Nerici. You know, they did isotonic, or what you might call traditional weight training. And they found, of course, if you look at the fascicle length, that there was an increase in the concentric only and the eccentric only group, just like we'd found. But they found a bias towards eccentric training. And it's not the first time they've seen that. And I have to say, we've got some data that we haven't published that suggests that maybe this is the case with isotonic training. It might be a bit different from isokinetic because in isokinetic, you basically hold the muscle and let it stretch the crap out of you. So this is a bit different, but you can still see here that fascicles lengthen irrespective of the contraction mode. Thought this was a little bit weird. Oh, by the way, the only the concentric group increased the fascicle angle which is also a bit interesting because remember we think that fascicle angle is good for strength, but we know that eccentric training gives you a lot of strength. So this is a bit of a, a weird finding, but it's a finding we usually do see. Here we have not statistically, but a greater panation angle change in concentric group, although again, we see, <coughs> excuse me, both groups get bigger panation. I won't get onto all the hamstring research. If you've read it, of course, I don't trust the ultrasound images and I've talked to these groups about it, they somehow find decreases in pination angle after strength training. I'm not sure why that's the case. It'd be interesting to look in the future. So I wondered, why is this the case? So I went back to some of your work, or at least the work of Walter Herzog's group. Tim Butterfield published this. The reason why I love this work is because they actually did the research properly. It's a really good, uh, um, a, a good lesson to learn. Because what they did was, instead of just assuming what the muscles did, they used the sonar micrometry crystals to watch the muscle fascicles or the muscle fibers during uphill and downhill walking in the rats. They provided evidence that in the uphill group, this dark bit here is when the muscle is active and it's usually active as the muscle is shortening. And in the downhill group, it's often active while the muscle is lengthening. So I said, okay, we haven't got these data in the VI, the vastus intermedius, which is the previously published data, but they do have it for the VL, which is the superficial muscle here. So what happens in these muscles? Well, in VI, they found the same as the other group. We get this really nice increase in sarcomere number if you go downhill. We get this really nice decrease in sarcomere if you run uphill. But of course, we don't know what the muscle was doing. We just make an assumption. But in the muscle where they did know what was going on, actually they found a reduction in sarcomere number in both groups. And this indicates that we don't know what the hell's going on. Because in the muscle where we actually know that we got concentric or eccentric contractions, we get the same outcome. A little statistical anomaly, one outlier, means that this is not statistically different to this. But of course, they responded about the same. And I just had a chat to Walter a couple of days ago. He said, are you right for me to tell everyone this? Because I wrote it in my paper at the time. He said, yeah, I completely agree with you. We've got no evidence at all in animals that eccentric contractions add sarcomeres in series. And of course, 
more data from your labs, Tim Coe, many, many years ago now, in rabbit muscle. Essentially no evidence that the sarcomere number is increasing in eccentric contractions in animals. So I looked at the data and I thought, actually, there's another opportunity here. Notice that when the muscle is active, the muscle is active when it's relatively quite short, not when it's quite long. Same in this group. When the muscle is short, it's active. When the muscle is long, it's not active. Maybe in this muscle, it was the length at which it was active that caused the sarcomere adaptation and not the mode of contraction, not concentric versus eccentric. So we can test this because a lot of the times um, in, in animal studies, if you get a change in sarcomere number, you get a change in the angle of peak torque or the, the length at which muscle produces its best force. And again, I thought I was really cool when we presented the first data that our changes in fascicle length in temporal response matched very closely what happened to the torque angle curve. So I thought, okay, here's the key. Maybe if you train at short muscle lengths, you get fewer sarcomeres and your angle of peak torque shifts this way towards a shorter muscle length at the knee. If you train at long muscle lengths, maybe you get longer fascicles and that might shift your angle of peak torque the other way. That's how I was reading the data at the time. And we came and I brought on a PhD student from uh, Estonia via Yavaskula, and she was a physio and she completely disagreed. She said, no, Tony, it's neurological. All the data suggests it's so rapid, it's a neural adaptation. I said, good, let's test this. So we got people back on our dynamometer, but this time we did isometric training. One group trained at a long muscle length, but we took not only their torque value, but measured the moment arms at different angles. Those of you who know biomechanics know that if we can multiply the torque by the moment arm, we can estimate the actual force in the muscle. What we wanted was the force to be identical between the groups, not just the torque created. And so if you train at a long muscle length group, what we did was, running out of batteries, I think, we, we found what the angle of peak torque was, and then we kept on testing until the muscle was so long that even if they produced maximal force, they could only produce 80% of what they could at their optimum angle. Now the short group, they then moved their muscle shorter and shorter until they could only produce 80% of their optimum. So now we have the same velocity, zero. We have the same force, 80% of whatever your maximum is. Uh, and we have the only difference being, hopefully, the muscle length. At least we thought that this was a really great way to do this experiment in humans, at least. Unfortunately, I learned another lesson. When you publish the data, make sure you put a really pretty graph of your data that works perfectly in a presentation, because then everyone else will present your data. Unfortunately, we didn't put one of these in, and I haven't had time to draw one. So I would just state things very, very clearly. Both groups got longer fascicles. So now what we're finding, it doesn't matter if you train concentrically, eccentrically, isometrically at a short length, isometrically at a long length, we're getting the same magnitudes of change and always an increase in fascicle length. We also put in this paper a correlation I'd seen previous, and that is if your fascicles are already long, you don't change. If your fascicles were relative to the group, short, you do change. Second question. I disproved my hypothesis that it was going to be a, a fascicle length dependence, but did the angle of peak torque shift and was it related to the change in fascicle length? The answer was no. Everyone got different shifts because they all trained differently and we found no evidence that it was related to the change in the fascicle. So again, I've disproved my own theory because I thought I was really cool in 2007 producing the nice graph but when I did what I think is a better study, and that's up to you to decide, we couldn't repeat our own findings, which is not a bad um, sort of lesson to learn. Remember, if you, this day and age of Twitter, when everyone's saying, you know, this is a landmark study and, you know, this is, what is it called? Not groundbreaking. Uh, there's a word that everyone uses now, pretty much every study that's published. Um, it's a game changer. Uh, this is a game changer. Well, until it's validated on multiple occasions, probably by different labs, it's not a game changer, it might not even be real. And we were lucky, we've discredited our own data. 
So what causes this torque angle shift? Well, I'll get onto that in a second because I just want to tell you something else here. There is another thing we expect. If the fascicles get longer because we add these sarcomeres, we also expect your ability to develop force at fast velocities to go up. So did we find that after the training? The answer was no. <laughs> at slow speeds, if you got muscle hypertrophy, you produced a bigger peak torque. If you got no hypertrophy, you didn't produce more torque. But there was no relationship to the change in fascicle length or the change in fascicle angle that we could detect in the data. So our take home message for that is that we have no evidence that fascicle length is actually related to a functional change during voluntary contractions in humans. And based on all the data that I've read, I'm still not convinced there's any good data that this is the case. So after 15 years of research, I certainly have proved myself wrong. Of course, a lot of people do believe that eccentric training lengthens fascicles and that longer fascicles will improve the power output or speed capability of a muscle. Now there's two things that could explain this. The first one is that if we, if the first one is that this increase in fascicle length has absolutely nothing to do with sarcomere addition in humans like we thought it did. And in fact, there is no evidence in humans that it is the case. We, we just make the assumption from what we saw in some rat studies. So the second po possibility is that because the human voluntary force production is so complex, Maybe some of these things are having an influence, but it's swamped by all the other changes that occur every time we try to change. Now, I do believe we have some evidence that this might be part of the problem. Here is cross-sectional data, but we've actually got training study data also on 36 people, and we find the same things. Here we tried to, we measured their concentric knee extension torque and then tried to predict it from things like their joint moment arm, as you know, a torque is a force times a distance. The muscle size, this is extended field of view of the quadriceps. The fascicle lengths, the panation angles, we measured these of course all the way down the thigh and in all four muscles. We also measured the activation level of the muscle, the levels of co-contraction. My poor student had a torrid time for three years collecting and analyzing the data. And what we find is that we use a modeling procedure to find what we call the best model. So it's not like standard linear regression. And what we find is things like pination angle on its own was not correlated in any way with strength. But if we added it to a model that already included cross-sectional area and moment arm, it significantly improved the model. We take this type of evidence to suggest that there are synergies here that if you just get a slightly bigger muscle, you may or may not really detect an increase in strength. But if that occurs with an increase in pination angle, and if you kind of already had a big moment arm, which is like a, an, a multiplier here, then you will probably see an increase in strength. And so when we look for a correlation with a single variable, we may not see anything. It may not mean it's not important. It just might mean that you also need a few other things to go your way before you see the true effect of it. At least that's a hypothesis we're running with at the moment. But of course, the other thing we noticed is that with the cross-sectional study and the training study, this prox thing comes up. What this means is when we're trying to predict strength, we couldn't get good models if we measured distally in the thigh. We couldn't even get good models if we measured at mid-thigh, which is where most of us do our measurements when we do training studies. We only got good data or good predictions in the proximal segment, suggesting to us both cross-sectionally and longitudinally that the proximal <coughs> segment may be more related to your ability to exert strength. Why? Still not sure. Got lots of ideas, but not sure. This idea of selective hypertrophy has been seen many, many times. Happens within muscles. It happens if you look between muscles. We've seen it also with jump squat versus heavyweight training in our lab. It's a common finding that hypertrophy varies across the muscle. Not sure why. Now in our study, this is the group that trained at the long muscle length. Take home message number one, hypertrophy when training at long lengths, no hypertrophy at short lengths. This is a common and consistent finding. So we're not the only ones to show this, but it's important to remember if you're trying to get people bigger. 
Second thing, big adaptations in some muscles, not in others. And we also notice this along the thigh, but I'll move on. The question is, has that got to do with anything? Well, now I can come back and try and answer the question. We did find changes in the angle of peak torque. What were they most associated with? Well, those people who trained at the short muscle length, all of them got better at the short muscle length. It had nothing to do with hypertrophy, fascicle length or fascicle angle, but it was strongly correlated with the percent voluntary activation through the interpolated twitch technique. So if you zap the muscle, you don't get much extra out of it once you've trained. And the EMG uh, M wave ratio. So basically your peak EMG, but normalized to that M wave in case there were peripheral adaptations. Now the long muscle length group was a different beast. Oh, by the way, so after this, my PhD student was laughing at me, right? I told you, Tony, it's a learning response. I said, yeah, fair enough, you've got me there. But the long muscle length group was interesting. In previous data, when you look at a group response, it looked like if you train at long muscle lengths, you get a broader response. When I was an undergrad, I was taught, if you train at short muscle length, you get a specific response. But if you train at long muscle length, you get a broader response across joint angles or muscle lengths. Our group data showed the same thing, but that's misleading. What we actually found was that some people who trained at long muscle length group got better at short muscle lengths and not long muscle lengths. So it's clearly not a learning response. It wasn't related to the architectural variables, um, antagonist co-activations or anything like this. It was very strongly correlated with where the hypertrophy was observed in the muscle using MRI scans. So people who got stronger at the short muscle length tended to see hypertrophy in their vastus medialis and rectus femoris, particularly distally in the thigh, or in their proximal VL, uh, VL up here in the thigh, proximally in the thigh. People, however, who did get stronger at the long muscle length tended to get most of their hypertrophy in the middle of VL. So these data indicate that maybe the location of the hypertrophy is affecting the way the force is transmitted and affects the joint angle at which you produce the best torque. No one has replicated or tried to replicate these data yet, so it's clearly just a hypothesis. It's an observation. But at the moment, it suggests that maybe this this unusual region-specific hypertrophy that we see in almost every training study that looks for it might actually have some physiological relevance. And it'd be interesting to explain, uh, explore this more in the future. So hypertrophy is definitely specific. And at the moment, we wonder whether that specificity has relevance. Very important for training studies, it means that if you're not measuring all the way along a thigh and you're just doing a single scan, or even if you're measuring the volume of the muscle, you may be missing important information. And those of you who are doing the, um, um, the molecular work, where we often stick a biopsy needle straight to the middle of VL, we also might be missing important synthetic information because we have this region-specific hypertrophy and it may have functional relevance. So I love muscles, although they've kind of made me look stupid over the years. But there's a big design limitation of muscles, and that is they produce a lot of slow speed force, but they can't produce force very well at high speeds. If, you should, if I calculated the amount of power output of the muscles in your legs right now, and then looked at the peak power in a vertical jump, I would only get about half of the power I need. So something is missing. If I model a sprinter with fast twitch muscle fibers, that sprinter only seems to run about half the speed that we can actually run. The question is, why is this the case? How is it that we move so fast? To the young kids, not you guys, of course, I would never, okay, let's do it. To the young kids, I always say this, can you click your fingers? Can you click your fingers right now? Have you ever figured out how you even click your fingers? When you click your fingers, of course, the, the noise isn't created here, okay, at your fingers. It's actually created when your finger hits this hole that you leave here. It's a percussion, it's a drum, right? But I have to hit fast, right? So if you do this, 
you can hear the click. Now, if you get ready right now to do this, but take your thumbs away and just use your muscles. These muscles are way down here. Go like this. So your muscles are too slow. You can't even click your fingers. That's how useless muscles are. <laughs> so, so here's my muscle way down here. If you do this, you'll see your muscles working. All of this is a tendon. And just like a flea or a grasshopper, that's you, you, you use a catch mechanism, you activate the muscle, you store all the energy, and then you let it go, and you get a high-speed movement. Because while a muscle is slow, those of you who are physiologists and love fast twitch muscle fibers, this is my sexy, I was just working it today in the gym, my sexy diamond master here. It is crap. <laughs> How's that gonna make us run? It doesn't, of course. We don't run by using muscle power alone. We have to use something else. We cheat. Those of you who know your kinetic chain principles know that we can use specific movement patterns, which allows us to translocate energy or power down limbs. It's pure physics. But of course, we can use something other than muscles to produce this power, and that is the tendon itself. So whenever we're moving at very high speeds, we need these tendons, which are infinitely faster than muscles, to produce the high-speed powers. And in something like running, this is Marcus Pandy's group in Melbourne who, took, who went to the AIS, collected a heap of sprint data, did some modelling, and this is what they see. This is the, the plantar flexor Achilles tendon unit, right? During the ground contact of sprinting. Of course, when you land, it stretches. When, it, when you propel yourself into the next step, it shortens. What their modelling showed was that the muscle seems to only be stretched a small amount. Now remember, a muscle can probably stretch by at least a few percent without cross bridges having to work or detach. So this is largely, not completely probably, but largely the muscle acting like a spring. And then the muscle very early tries to produce positive work, or positive power. It's not very good. Look at it relative to the muscle tendon unit. And it's even at the wrong time, stupid muscle. <laughs> this is what happens to the tendon. The tendon gets stretched, stretched dramatically, storing energy. According to Hooke's law, it of course has a recoil force. And when the force drops just enough by a whole bunch of funky biomechanics, it will recoil at a very high speed, a high power output. And the combination of that, along with some additional muscular work, is what gives us this high power output of the whole muscle tendon unit. Their modeling indicates, for example, that the tendon shortening speed is more than twice what the muscle ever achieves during sprinting. And these sorts of data and many others has led us to the hypothesis that when we're doing things like, it's not gonna play, is it? Because I'm on someone else's computer. But anyway, if you were running, you would run more like a bouncing ball. And a belief is, is that we're able to store and release elastic energy even during jogging activities. So even during slow speed activities. Now, of course, we can use all that ultrasound stuff that I'm happy to chat about at a later date, and we can measure the stiffness of a tendon in vivo in humans. And Aaron Patz's lab in Germany have been doing this for years, and what they showed was that if you're a sprinter, where you have to produce huge forces in very small amounts of time, you tend to have very stiff tendons, meaning that if I produce a big force, the tendon doesn't stretch very far, okay? Compared to joggers and people like you and me, where if we produce about the same force by applying a slow muscle activation, our tendons tend to stretch further. So they're more compliant, right? They're less stiff. Of course, here's the thing that I often talk to strength and conditioning coaches about. So in your own mind, I won't do a participation thing, but if you're a sports scientist or if you're a strength and conditioning coach, think about this one. Which event requires the biggest force to be produced in a very short time interval? Sprint running, the ground contact phase of maximal sprint running, a maximal height counter movement vertical jump, or jogging? The answer is, in sprinting, you may produce 220 kilos of force in about 0.1 of a second. 220, 0.1. In a counter-movement jump, you may produce 180 kilos of force 
in about 0.35 of a second. So less force, three times or more the duration. In jogging, we also produce about 180 kilos of force on the ground, but we produce it in about 0.2 of a second, nearly twice as fast as the maximal counter movement jump. And by the way, when you jog, one foot's doing that on the ground. In a counter movement jump, that's two feet. So a counter movement jump is a ridiculously poor high power output activity. It's so slow that we don't even really, some people don't even consider it a true strip shorten cycle. Jogging, high power, big force, short duration of force application. If that's the case, I would have expected that a stiff tendon would be good in my runners because a stiff tendon has a faster recoil speed and according to Hooke's law, produces a bigger recoil force against its load. This is not what they show here, but they resolve this discrepancy by showing that actually the most economical runners do have stiffer Achilles tendons, the least economical runners didn't. Now, of course, you take this with a grain of salt until it can be validated, verified by other groups. Again, please publish, guys. <laughs> My PhD student didn't, but I can show you that in British elite runners, we found exactly the same thing. So these are all elite now, and yet those people who, of course, had the lowest oxygen cost were those who had the stiffest Achilles tendons. Those who used more oxygen tended to have less stiff tendons. But of course, while that fits our hypothesis and looks pretty, just remember, we see the same relationship for peak strength. Now, peak strength is usually needed when you have stiff tendons because you've got to stretch the damn things. So it makes a lot of sense. I guess you could argue, we don't know, what chicken or the egg, which one's most important. But we get these ideas based on the data we see and the theory that, that the property of the tendon matters. And just because some of you may be more in the clinical area, I'll throw up these recent data. They, these guys in, in your vascular found no relationship though in, in elderly people between strength and tendon stiffness of the knee and the ability to walk rapidly. But they did find some uh, um, evidence in the Achilles tendon. And as some of your experts here in the room have shown, the plantar flexors seem to be really important for things like walking. So as a biomechanist, you might start to think to yourself, look, it's not just about do I need a muscle like this or a tendon like this, but which muscles and which tendons need what properties? Of course, if you want to stiffen the tendon like this, we already know that strength training is really, really important. We know that in the patella or the Achilles, if you get stronger, your tendon tends to get stiffer. Makes lots of sense. But I just want to finish by showing you one lot of recent data that we've got. And I'd like to do this better one day. But we've got very good athletes to do a knee extension stretch shorten cycle. So it's a very simple movement. And because we can't put a, an ultrasound very well onto the tendon without noise at the knee, we had to measure up at the muscle and use a bit of a model to kind of figure out what might be happening at the sort of distal tendon region. But what we see is this. If you lift a very heavy load, 90% of your max, as hard as you can, biggest counter movement, stretch, shorten, cycle, knee you can, you clearly get a huge force. If you use a lighter load, where you obviously move a lot faster, you don't actually get such a big peak force. Based on this, you'd expect the tendon at the knee to stretch a lot more under the heavy load than the light load. But we found no evidence. This is the lengthening of the tendon that we predict from our model, and it's approximately the same in both groups. We believe the reason for this is that the very rapid rate of force development invokes the dynamic stiffening of the tendon because it's viscoelastic, meaning the tendon doesn't stretch as far as you'd expect. Of course, if it is stiffer, it's still storing more energy, right? Because if you have a stiffer tendon or you stretch it further, you store more energy. So it's still going to contribute a lot to this stretch shorten cycle. But maybe these velocity dependent characteristics of tendon are visible in human movements. And if that's the case, then maybe we've got a question every time we've done these studies in the past where we only measure stiffness, stretching the tendon slow. So to finish, what I wanna know are a few things. First of all, are all these findings repeatable? We love them, but until they are shown over and over again, they are not in any way factual. 
Is there a better way to do these? We've been using models to predict what the tendon is doing. We use ultrasound to measure muscle architecture, and we really need better methods in the future. Are these muscle and are they tendon specific? Notice we're always testing the Achilles tendon and the vastus lateralis. And so really we could be leading everyone astray by only looking at a few areas of the body. And are these findings similar across all the different populations? More importantly, what does this then tell us about how we might train these things in order to optimize the human? If I have to build the optimum human, the optimum robot for a task, what do we yet know? Now, unfortunately, despite all my efforts, I really don't know much at all. So if you've got any ideas, I'd really love to hear them. Thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, for the sake of the webinar, uh, I hope uh, the class of can repeat the questions when people ask. Oh, OK, yeah. 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 So the floor is open for questions. Graham? Uh, when you're talking about the running economy, the figures you have, one looking at the tendon stiffness, the other one looking at the force. Um, did you look at the relationship between the two? Say that again, sorry, I couldn't hear. So when you look at running economy, you have figures, one was looking at, I think, at tendon stiffness, and then one was looking at, uh, I think, muscle beat force. Yes, and they are correlated. So they're intercorrelated. Which actually, so, so the question was, we measure running economy during running, and we find that it's related to both the stiffness of the tendon, and I'll proclaim how we currently measure it at the velocities we currently measure it at, but it was also correlated with the peak isometric strength of the muscle. And therefore, is it just that the Achilles tendon and the force are related? And the answer is yes. People who tend to be stronger have stiffer tendons. If you take a five-year-old child, they have very compliant tendons. The question is, as we age and we get stiffer tendons, is that a maturational process? Or is that just because we get bigger and stronger? So of course it's stiffer. And all the evidence we found is that you, it's just a growth. You get bigger, you get stronger. So in other words, across species and even within humans, bigger, stronger animals and bigger muscles tend to have stiffer tendons, at least within the requirement for their job. Achilles tendon is obviously a locomotor tendon. So a few, a few people I know that are generally, they generally only perform strength training, um, and they started running, they started they breathing at Achilles ruptures. And do you think that's because of the fact that their muscle is not adapting and the tendon is not adapting with the rate of muscle adaptation? So the question then is that um, if you start heavy strength training, you get stronger. You're saying sometimes we see these tendon ruptures? Yeah. Is that because they haven't adapted? This is a really interesting question. The short answer is I don't know, right? So I'm only, I can only speculate. First of all, it does seem like they have slightly different adaptive timeframes. But what I found really interesting, and maybe some people in the room know this better than me, is that in some of the older animal data, people were showing failure rates of tendons to go up in the first week or two and then have a slight dip before coming back up. And I used to see those data, and they occurred around about the four to eight week period of training in an animal model. And I wondered if what this is is a a period of weakness or a period of overtraining, suggesting that, you know, if, you, if you, you do your first couple of weeks and you start to think, I feel good, I'm going to train harder, but maybe the tendon is either going through some sort of unusual phase or at least it stops adapting for a brief period. It's something I've seen and I can't prove or disprove. But the other thing is, where is the tendon injury occurring? If you change your strength, you change your technique. So as you change your physical capacity, if you then run differently, you then load differently. And so the tendon may have improved its properties, you know, in a straight line with tendon stiffness or in using the exercises you've done. But then if you go and run and you run differently, you might be completely loading the fibers within the tendon differently. And that might be part of the injury process. So it's not just that you need to increase your strength in the gym or whatever. It's that even all of your other training needs to be maybe more progressive until the tendon adapts to that loading. They're just my hypotheses at the moment. With your four to six weeks thing, you think that, like people say, with the neural adaptations first, and then you get the mechanical adaptation, and that's what you're seeing at the four to six week mark? So in the four to six weeks, you're right, we tend to get a lot of neural adaptation, particularly to strength training. When, when we say that, it's really to do with the strength training, although you learn lots of other movements in those times too. Um, 
But of course, there is protein synthesis like immediately in tendons and immediately in muscles. It just takes long time for it to be substantial enough for us to observe it. The, the thing about tendons is how they increase stiffness has two different pathways. One is the material properties and the structure and build of the tendon can change. So you'll see a change in its modulus. But two, it can increase cross-sectional area. Based on current evidence, it looks like cross-sectional area takes a long time. But it may be that it's the cross-sectional area that causes the protection. So what we might be doing is seeing the tendon adapt, you might perform better, it gets stiffer. But because the cross-section hasn't really improved at that point, it might, might be under a period of um, relative weakness to the muscle. But you know, these are all speculations, right? So I'm just throwing it out there and, and I'll look stupid in 10 years like normal. <laughs> Uh, so you showed a, a plot by Pandy that seems kind of weird to me. So just wondering, can we take another look at it? And yeah. Can you explain what it was interesting. Was? I was waiting. I thought as soon as I was presenting it, I thought, hmm, I wonder if Art has a question about the Pandy stuff. I'd love to hear your impressions of it. Well, uh, the first question is just what muscle is that? So this is the, they measured on the gastroc medialis and the Achilles tendon. They had the 3D motion analysis, of course, during the running to get the estimate of the muscle tendon unit length. Okay, um, and then when they say muscle fiber, do they mean the gastroc or are they doing something with also soleus? That's a really good question. I have to consult the paper to double check that. So I can't tell you right now whether that's, because they do, they say muscle fiber. No, it can't be the fiber. It's clearly, well, they can in a model, I guess. You're assuming really that that's the fascicle. And what I can't tell you off the top of my head is whether that is truly the, say, soleus muscle fascicle, where they look at the force, take it to the cosine of the, the panation angle, or whether that's actually the muscle, the gastrocnemius muscle length itself, and they've just called it muscle fiber. I'd have to double check. I've got it on my computer, though, so maybe after this, we can have a really quick look at that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll but, yeah, what's complain your point? about this, which is that the MTU can only produce its positive work can only come from muscle because the the tendon itself net produces zero network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want the positive part of the MTU to be no bigger than the positive part of the muscle fiber. And what the tendon lets you do is lets you shift that around in time so you get a higher peak power and stuff like that. But I want the shaded area to add up, you know, I want to be able to shift around the shaded area so that it fits under the the black curve, and then it looks like it's way under that. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, the part that's not under the black curve, you could just imagine moving it over, and then it's way under the MTU. And then I was going to complain that that mm -hmm. can't be, but it can be if there are other sources of energy, right? Such mm -hmm. as so for Achilles, and if if this was um, looking at one of the muscle muscles in there, then it's other muscles that are contributing. Yeah. So then I can't say this is totally wrong, but I would say it's misleading because it's not it's it's trying to illustrate something but it's not showing mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. the uh, the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So I clearly can't re re respond to all of that in, in the <laughs> microphone. But in many ways I agree with you. So first of all, it's a complex muscle group and there are multiple muscles attaching to the Achilles. So when you're only looking at one or two muscles, you're not sure of exactly where muscle energy is coming from. The second thing I will say, though, is, is that in counter movement jumping, um, the idea that the muscle does work early and then the tendon does work later at the point at which the highest velocity is attained is a kind of a recognized finding. So in that sense, I'm, I, the, the timing issues here may be slightly out, but I kind of that's the main point of the slide. But right, the third, I, and I agree. I agree with that idea. I'm just saying. Yeah. I don't think this is. But but actually, there is another source of energy here, and of course, that's gravitational energy. So you've got to, and, and this is what I'd like to understand <coughs> better, is that if I'm landing with gravity and I've pre-activated, so this is obviously after the pre-activation, we've got muscle work. But of course, as we land, if the muscle produces, this is power, right? So if the muscle is for any period of time isometric, there is no power and there is no work, but there can be mechanical force and the tendon can be stretched under the load, the kinetic energy of the body descending with gravity could then be stored in the tendon, in which case we could theoretically get 
But then what I haven't thought about, yeah, is what that would mean at the back end of the tendon recoil. So I, I, I feel like we do have free energy of gravity and that power and work can be misleading because the muscle can still be applying a force and then that gravitational or the kinetic energy of the body can be stored in the tendon. What I haven't done in my mind before is then follow that right through to the end and say, well, when I recoil and I get that energy back out, should that then do what you suggest? And that is equalize the, the numbers. But I, I can't tell you the answer to that. What Do you have an impression on the gravitational idea? Oh, well, so I, I don't think of it as gravity giving you energy because you, you, unless you're going up or downhill, with each step you okay. are you know, getting back what you spent on gravity. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would say that a muscle doesn't have to produce zero work, or sorry, an MTU doesn't have to produce zero work because you can have some muscles that produce net positive work mm. and some that do net negative. So here it's a case where the MTU does you could say close to zero work because you could see the negative part and the positive mm -hmm. part maybe it does a little bit of net positive work but uh the, all that means is if that doesn't add up that's fine because it's going somewhere else yeah, yeah. My, my complaint is just if you had a muscle fiber in series with the tendon you know, you're trying sure. to illustrate this this uh the time movement effect then i i think this is not adding up but i think it's in a way, it's a it's a tough example because the yeah. Achilles is complicated. Yeah. John, sorry, when you say muscle fiber is this muscle fiber activation or force output? Is, it, is this EMG yeah. or force output in this model? Yes. Okay, so um, in this uh, paper, they used um, they used uh, modeling parameters to estimate what was going on during the actual running. So they had the ground reaction force, they had the 3D motion analysis data, and then they had all the EMG on the muscles to look at their timing and relative activations. And then they estimate what the muscle tendons were doing. They then use ultrasound during these movements to try to recalibrate what the muscles and tendons would do. So it's not, it's, it's a model, right? So it's not perfect. I can't say that this is exactly what happens. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that you talked about some muscle issues in terms of timing, but to me, that faster muscle contraction, if it's a contraction, that faster muscle contraction yields a platform, should be a kind of anticipatory kind of contraction in the muscle to build a platform for muscle tendon unit to work based on it. So if you think that you want to, as you mentioned yourself, if you want to make a kind of contraction in, in this movement, first you build up force in the muscle, then force actually transfer to muscle tendon unit and the movement is done. Mm -hmm. So for me, the timing is not surprising. Mm -hmm. It should be a kind of anticipatory adjustment in muscle contention. In the next phase, it's going to go to the muscle tendon unit. Mm -hmm. So I was confused that when you said it was an issue, and I didn't know how it could be an issue when it is totally, to me, it's totally normal. Mm -hmm. Well, I've kind of missed your point on when I said it was an issue, but I agree with everything that you said. And the other thing that we need to remember is that we pre-activate. So what that means is this is only the power output once the foot touches the ground in the model. We don't know what happened before it. So the muscle, of course, can do work on the tendon, which means the tendon can theoretically give more work. And it might be, and you can see over here, that oh, here it might be. I'd have to double check whether this area equals this area. I'm not too sure. But yeah, maybe we need to have a chat later. And again, these aren't my data, so I can't really talk to them in the level of detail. I have a question here that somebody's uh, posting from watching the webcast, and they said, do you think the different velocity of muscle actions could improve mixed muscle tendon unit? <laughs> could the? Could improve mixed muscle tendon unit. So could increasing the velocity of the muscle action, yeah. action increase the? <laughs> their, their question isn't. Yeah, so I, let me see if I can guess what they mean here. <laughs> if I change, say, the force velocity properties of the muscle, does that then affect the way the muscle tendon unit functions? I would assume. And that. therefore the power output. So if we take, again, a really simple model, my answer is yes, but we have no, have no experimental data, only theoretical modeling. So if, if I have a tendon, I wish I had brought my elastic bands and my weights with me like my students need. If I, have a, if I have a tendon, an elastic band here with a weight or an inertia at the end of it, 
and here is a muscle that's going to pull. If the muscle pulls very slowly, actually it takes time for energy to get from one end to the other. It's not instantaneous. The force at one end is not equal to the force at the other, like we often assume. But if I pull slowly, there is very little extension in the, in the tissue before the force reaches the other end and accelerates the load. So almost theoretically, if I move slow enough, you won't see any movement in the muscle. So you get no amplification of power. If I move faster, however, several things happen. The first one is that because it still takes time, although that time is reduced because the increase in stiffness also increases the transit speed of energy through a material, that if you pull it a bit faster, it actually will lengthen the tendon more before there's an acceleration of my load. So more energy is stored. But not only is more energy stored, because it's longer, it's now stiffer. Okay, because if I stretch any material, its stiffness increases at some relationship based on the, the tissue. And so in the, the short answer, because it gets more complicated than that, but the short answer is, if I can improve the ability for my muscle to generate rapid force in a simple setting, it theoretically should allow me to store more energy and stiffen the tendon more and therefore get a greater energy back out and power output back out of a tendon. Yeah? The problem with modeling that is tendons aren't easy to model because they're a structure. They're not a material. So, and the structure has a big influence on its properties. So we've tried to you know, put it into a model and see what happens, but it's probably wrong. And one thing we want to do in the next year or two is actually do a lot of testing of tendons to look at this relationship. It's a very interesting question. It's the next question. Muscle does one thing, tendon does another, but how are they working together? I was really interested in your explanation as to why endurance runners have stiff Achilles tendons. Would your explanation be the same given the stiffness of the quad, for example, is lower in these economical runners? Yeah, well, yes. So the, the question is, the, the, this, the, there's one study, it hasn't been replicated yet, by the way, that it, if you measure at lower force levels in the patella or knee tendon, more compliance is related to better running economy. But we've also looked at that and couldn't find this relationship. Doesn't mean it's not there, just I haven't been able to replicate it yet. If it's true, it might have something to do with the force requirements at the knee. So at the foot, of course, you have some mo external moment arm and a huge force and a very small internal moment arm in the Achilles. At the best estimates are that sprinters and endurance runners have longer feet, so a bigger external moment arm, and a smaller internal moment arm. So they're built for this. At the knee, when we land, we land with a relatively straight knee. And if you do the calculation, the external moment arm is very small at the knee. We have a, maybe the same or slightly bigger moment arm at the knee. And of course, therefore, it, the, the loading characteristics are very, very different. Now remember, the patella tendon is, is actually quite stiff and it has a big bone in the middle of it, the patella. So the whole structure is actually quite stiff. And so what that group showed was not that a compliant tendon is good. What they showed is that in a group of runners, those who are less stiff had a better running economy for whatever reason. I think there's some logic there. But remember, that doesn't mean the tendon was not stiff. It just was within that group where they sat. So does that help answer the question? I thought Jared was going to say he did duplicate the, the uh, observation that Aeropathus had on the Achilles tendon. Yeah. The stiffer tendon is correlated with uh, a lower energy cost of running. Yeah, perfect. Um, but, and, and, but we've also done a lot of other work on this. And one of the things that you said was that a stiff tendon can store more energy. If it's stretched to the same distance. Yes, exactly. Mm. But if you're running, the load is going to be the same and a stiffer tendon won't stretch as much. Mm -hmm. So the storage of energy will be less in these more economical runners. Um, yeah. You know what? What I'm not sure of, so, so so if you can stretch it a bit more, you store a lot of more energy. If you increase stiffness, it increases energy, but not by very much. So I guess the question is, if the energy, if it's a bit more stiffer and we say, oh, we don't stretch it as far, the question is, well, how much less 
do we stretch it? And then you'd have to do the calculation. If we assume, of course, that if the forces are equal and it gets stiffer, uh, it elongates much less, because elongation is so important, you're absolutely right, it would store less energy. So then the question would be, well, why would we do that? Why would we store less energy? Um, I don't know, but I could speculate that also a stiffer tendon has a much stronger recoil force against a load. So in the propulsive phase, if you have a very compliant tendon, let's go to the real extreme because it's easy to model, a very compliant tendon will stretch easily and store a huge amount of energy. It won't recoil at all against a reasonable load. But a stiff tendon, which is hard to stretch, will store much less energy. But it will provide a huge recoil force against the load and therefore accelerate the load well. So I think it becomes really complicated as to what's more important, just the energy amount or the acceleration imparted by the tendon. So first of all, if you store less energy in the tendon, it's not going to provide more acceleration because there won't be the energy there. But there is energy there. And if, if the instantaneous stiffness of the tendon is lower, then the instantaneous force is lower. And therefore, the instantaneous acceleration must be lower. Let me, let me offer an alternative explanation cool. as long as we're speculating. Yeah. <laughs> Jared has published this. Which is all we can do. <laughs> the energy cost of muscle contraction will increase if the muscle has to shorten more For sure. during a given contraction. And if you have a more compliant tendon, the muscle fibers will shorten more mm -hmm. and the energy cost is higher. So the <clears> amount <throat> of energy that you store in the tendon is relatively minor in comparison to the energy cost of the muscle Mm, I completely agree. What I'm interested in is what the effect of pre-activation is on that. And in distance running, you don't want to pre-activate a lot because it costs energy to pre-activate, but we certainly do, which means we've already stretched the tendon a bit and it's already higher on its curve. And I'm really interested to know what effect that has on, on these sorts of ideas. Does it, yeah, maybe we need to talk about it later because it gets more and more complicated every time I think of something new. <laughs> I think it's concerned when we talk about jogging or running and storage and return of energy. I mean, we have animals that are really good in that. Mm -hmm. And the characteristic is that the tendons are huge and the muscles are very small. As a matter of fact, they are probably not even there to produce force to move, but they are probably them. Just tune okay. the system, something, yeah. Something like that. Now, the humans are not constructed like that. And that's uh, our colleagues have shown. The work that you have to do to get that energy that you have stored is about the same as the work that you have to do to, to make the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think for human locomotion, that storage and return of energy is important. I, I may be wrong, but I, I no, can't I, see how it is. It's a really good point. It's a really good point. And it's one that I keep grappling about. And it's one that I kept trying to ask, ah, you know, someone tell me the answer to this. Because I agree, you have to do work on a tendon. And remember, a tendon will dissipate energy. So you're losing some of the energy you're doing work on the tendon. Why would it, it's, it's a structure that had that hysteresis be used yeah. to storage and return energy? Would be completely yeah. Decide. yeah, and one of them is simply that when you land on the ground, it may help to minimize that collisional force that, that, that a lot of the biomechanists talk about. So maybe that's where the efficiency comes from. It just allows a compliant leg, stops that large re-acceleration of the body and the energy that would be lost at that point. One of the things that, and then again, I'm, I'm really keen to talk to anyone who's interested in this because I don't have the answers. I'm not here to tell you the answers. That's why I use the word speculate and I'm not sure very often. But one of the things that I, I've been noticing is that a lot of people talk about the energy as if the energy is what truly matters in the system. And what I've been interested in and what I'd like to talk to about people in the future is if I store energy at rate A, but when it comes back, it comes back at a faster rate, B. Same energy, but does that then affect how I'm moving? And is that then useful just from a propulsive perspective, even though it's not necessarily the case for an energy perspective. So, uh, you know, um, I can stretch a rubber band very slowly, therefore my muscle can work at a slow velocity where it's a little bit more effective, but then I can release that 
if the mechanics of the system unload it and allow the release of the energy, it can then recoil at a much faster speed. So I can load slowly, which is what we do when we pre-activate before landing on the ground. We can load and then I can release that and it can accelerate much faster than I loaded it. And what I'm interested in is whether that benefit is one of the benefits of using this in locomotion, even in humans who aren't really built for these processes. Of course, again, there's other people who are better talking about this than me, but the, the ideas that I learned from these other guys about the collisional energy loss might be another reason why we have this compliance structure. Sure, we have to do work on it that's equivalent or even less than what we get out of it, but maybe we're then not dissipating as much when we land on the ground and have to re-accelerate our body in a different direction. Uh, so part of uh, what I want to say is just to agree with you that the pattern is not necessarily constant no matter what. So if you were to train someone to change their tendon stiffness, their running pattern can also change. And so uh, all sorts of things can happen. So it's, it's not a given that changing tendon stiffness no, means that exactly. something is going to store or return more or less energy. But I want to argue against Brian a little bit in that I just don't think the goal of running is to store more energy in tendon and return it. And uh, maybe the example of that is imagine you have two rubber balls that are perfect. One is super stiff and one is super compliant. If they're perfect, they'll both bounce and they'll store and return 100% of their energy. And so you can bounce, you know, whatever height you want. The softer ball is going to store and return more energy. Although overall, they're both jumping and bouncing at the same height. What's the difference between them? The softer ball deforms more on the ground and then you get that back. And so effectively, they're both equally good bouncers. One of them spends more time on the ground. It has more uh, deformation on the ground. Other than that, there's no reason to say one is better than the other. Interesting analogy. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't repeat that one. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. It's really interesting. So this is a question again from the web. This is from Jeff Powers at the University of Guelph. And he would like to say that he's very excited to tune in for your talk. Oh, thanks. So uh, he said, he poses this question. He says, you dismissed, dismissed the role of fiber type on performance, <laughs> owing to the greater role of fascicle length. And I certainly agree with that. Have you considered that fascicles would be composed of different motor units, both fast and slow? Given this, the fast would reach peak force sooner, essentially stretching the slow before they are generating peak force. I imagine this would influence fascicle dynamics and overall performance. <coughs> Should have given him the microphone so he can read that out, actually, because it's very hard to it's repeat. Okay. That. I'm it's, on, you're under the microphone. Okay, great. Um, great that he's tuning in. I didn't expect that. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I shouldn't say that I dismiss, I just joke about fiber type not being important. Of course, it has a lot of different aspects of importance and I just like to always make a point that, that, that all, I usually argue in favor of the opposite. You know, if I hear one thing all the time, I like to remind people about something else and, and it's the same thing with fiber type is it's all I hear because I work with a lot of physiologists in strength and conditioning, a lot of speed athletes who talk about fast twitch fibers. So I just like to remind everyone that there's more to it than that. Um, as far as the different fiber types within muscle, it's an interesting one about a, a fast twitch fiber that might be sitting next door to a slower twitch fiber and producing tension at different um, duration, um, um, at different rates, yes. It is absolutely true though then that if you did have one fiber sitting next to the other, one can theoretically do work on another, right? Because they are attached through a connective tissue structure. What the implications of that are, I'm not sure. Surely there is some energy dissipation. And maybe one of the reasons we improve with training is that we improve, uh, reduce the loss of energy from that setting. Of course, the other problem is, is that under the very fastest muscle shortening speeds, there is an argument that given that there's always a load in the human body, it's very rare that we, well, we'd never have an unloaded shortening speed in humans. And so if we're moving a muscle as fast as we possibly can, there is some argument, depending on the muscle, that the slow twitch fibers aren't really generating tension at all, even once they're activated. In which case you are relying on those fast twitch muscle fibers, which are transmitting energy end to end to an aponeurosis or tendon, but they're also transmitting a huge amount of that energy to neighboring fibers. 
I would think that that would be lost. I would think that would be a problem, but I haven't in myself seen modeling or uh, empirical data of how important that is. So I can't actually answer the question. I'm sorry. Anyone else in the room have an idea on that? There's more muscle experts than me here. No? Brian, well, give it a go. If you have a fast twitch and a slow twitch fiber that are stimulated at the same time, and you're going to change the length, they will both generate some force at whatever rate they can under those circumstances. It's not as though one is necessarily dragging the other one along. They're both contributing. The slow twitch fiber, if you're having shortening while this is going on, the slow twitch fiber will obviously contribute less, but it will still contribute force unless mm -hmm. the velocity is faster than its maximum velocity. Yeah, yeah, super, super high, yeah. Which I'm not sure can happen in a human because we've always got inertia. Just a, one really delayed comment on the one half kx squared. Um, tendon is nonlinear in the toe region, right? <coughs> yeah. So, and, and that's the operating region in most activities, right? So it might be important to consider that the, the energy is actually the area under that curve. So the shape of that nonlinear region, any change in shape in, <coughs> in that region could affect the energy storage, whereas if you if you just consider that it's a linear spring, then it gets stiffer, it stretches less, but the area under the curve remains the same. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you have a change in the shape of the toe region, then it could stretch to, well, I guess, I'm not sure the relationship would be, but the, but the, mm -hmm. the upper bound would be the one half kx squared, right? Yes, so, so the, the, just to repeat it for the microphone then, the idea is that the stiffness of a tendon is non-linear, so it's curves. Um, actually, some of the stuff that we have, it, it, we haven't even been able to find a proper linear, you know, I mean, it's almost it's textbook, reached, you know. Right. Um, and so if you change the shape of that linear, when we say the stiffness of a tendon, yeah, we have to make just some definition. In some papers, we've done it but not published, and the, the papers by Aaron Patsis, what we sometimes do is measure the stiffness at different points in the curve. And then when we say, you know, could the change in tendon properties influence performance, we usually look at the force we believe would be going through the tendon in that movement and try and find that region of the curve and say, is there a change in the properties at that point in the curve that's related to the movement? And that's the better way to go. But like you say, there's a huge number of papers that say, oh, we measured the stiffness from 50 to 100% of force. And here's what it related to. And yet in the movement, they're not even producing anything like that force. And so that may not be telling us anything about the tendon properties under that loading condition. And I completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't know much about how training is affecting it and or how the rate of stretch of the tendon is how training or detraining affects stiffness measured under different rates. Because we measure stiffness under very slow stretch conditions. And that may honestly have nothing to do with the properties of the tendon loaded dynamically during human movement. So I was wondering about uh, when the muscles were trained at long lines and at short lines, and there was similar changes in terms of uh, past lines. I'm wondering about the changes in the torque and the relationship, if there were any shifts in these. And also, how do you explain this? No difference in the what? Sorry. So in the training study, we trained a short muscle length group and a long muscle. I'm just repeating it for the microphone and a long muscle length group. Yeah. So uh, do you see? So first, do you see any shift in the torque and the relationship, uh, or any difference between the shifts between these two uh, types of training? Yes. And then. Do you think that it's the tendon that compensating that the muscle is going to change, but the tendon by becoming maybe more compliant in one case and then stiffer in the other is compensating for the changes that might happen? Good question. So first of all, um, I haven't got a keyboard here, so I can't go back. How do you go back? Your right hand mouse click. Um, um, okay, first answer is yes. We saw shifts in the torque angle relationship. People who trained at People who trained at short muscle lengths, so their knee was quite extended, all of them improved at that joint angle, more than at the long muscle length. So it was very specific.
the people who trained at long muscle length had wildly variable changes. Some of them, about half of them, improved at the long muscle length, but about the other half improved somewhere else, including at very short muscle lengths. So when they trained at long muscle lengths, it was highly variable. The second part of your question is, I think, could this be related? We didn't, we didn't find a relationship to fascicle length of those changes, so could it be that differential changes in the tendon might impact on it? I think that's a really good hypothesis. Based on what we know about tendon adaptation though, we trained everyone at a joint angle where the estimated force in the muscle and therefore in the tendon was 80% of their, the maximum they could possibly produce at their peak angle. So we took the moment arm of the knee and we took co-activation and we estimated what the force was and then we trained one group at a long muscle, oh, sorry, what's that to you? A short muscle length, but at 80%, and the other one at a long muscle at 80%. And therefore, theoretically, the force was identical. And if there were changes in the tendon, we would assume they were identical. That's the short answer. Now, there is very limited data, and I've never seen it repeated, that the changes in the tendon could be more related to the signaling that happens in the muscle and the changes in hypertrophy of the muscle than the actual stretching stimulus in the tendon. Because we normally think the tendon adapts to the load on the tendon itself. Now, if they are right, and if the long muscle length group got hypertrophy and the short didn't, maybe, maybe there would be a differential change in the tendon properties between our two groups. But based on current evidence, we don't believe that that's the case. Last question. Yeah, I have a question. How is the efficiency of the muscle tendon unit influenced by the discontinuity of the myotendinous junction? So how is the efficiency of the MTU affected by what happens at the, the muscle tendon junction? Really good question. Um, I can't tell you the answer to that off the top of my head, to be honest. I think that will depend a lot on the structure of the muscle tendon unit itself and how the force is delivered. Um, how many muscles are combining onto the tendon. Uh, for example, you could have a, um, a relatively simple system of a single, largely um, straight fibred muscle attaching to an MTU of uh, a linear tendon, in which case there should be a roughly, a relatively good transfer of force. Now you're going from a muscle fiber to a collagen matrix, but it's, it sort of transfers along it there's stretch, so there is energy loss, but I don't see any you know, new amazing things that might come out of the modeling. Having said that, you have a plantar flexor group, which has at least three muscle heads, maybe more, attaching onto a, uh, an Achilles tendon, where the Achilles tendon is now immediately rotating like a rope. It works like a rope does, so that it can stretch more without breaking, hopefully. Um, and that completely changes the transfer of force and the efficiency of force. And I haven't seen any modeling as to whether a rope-like tendon like an Achilles transfers force through the MTJ because of the rotation, any difference from a linear MTU. It could be different and I, I just don't know. Before we, uh, we end this seminar, I have one <laughs> idea to just put forward. You don't have to answer that. Like, you have been, we have been arguing about elastic energy, stored energy. It's like, what if it is the basic properties of muscle, muscle uh, force velocity relationship? What if, um, based on the results that you saw, the fascicle length increases by 5% after training and the tendon stiffness increases? What if it is because, you know, the tendon is used to modulate the speed of the shortening of the muscle so that the stiffer of the tendon decreases the speed of the shortening and therefore increases the force output. It could be one of the Maybe. mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm no more, more interested in uh, mechanisms. Yeah, nice. Well, actually, I have an opposite answer to this too, an opposite thought. Why do the fascicles look 5% longer every time we train them? Yeah, because, because now, that, now that you shorten less, because the tendon is stiffer, mm. that's why you need a longer fascicle length to support it. Yeah, or there is no change in fascicle length at all. Maybe there is no adaptation in the sarcomeres at all. 
And maybe it's just that if the tendon is a little bit stiffer and its resting tension is higher, it's applying a very low level pull onto the muscle when it's fully relaxed and maybe the fascicles look longer. I don't know. We don't even know why the fascicles look. I always say look longer, not are longer, because I don't know that they're actually longer. They just look longer on our ultrasounds. And I don't know what that means because I'm not finding any relationship to functional outcome, but then it's a complex human. So maybe, I don't know. I just don't know. That's the take home message. I've got no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's take this take home message home. And let's thank Dr. Blasovich again. (laughs) (laughs) We come back next week. We have uh, Ricky Watari. Ricky? Ricky. He's a PhD student of uh, Dr. Reed Ferber, and he will share with us his evidence-informed methods for predicting rehabilitation outcomes in patellofemoral pain. So, see you next week.